everyone. We're going we're gonna to get uh, started here. Um, so it's my uh, great pleasure to introduce today's seminar speaker. Uh, Mr. Mike Peavy was born in New York a City and raised in San Francisco and holds a BA and an MS in economics from UC Berkeley. Uh, he served in many roles throughout a very distinguished career, so I'll just list the ones relevant to his contributions to the energy field. Um, he served as the president of the California Council for Environmental and Economic Balance, an officer and president of the Southern California Edison Company founder and president of New Energy, which is an energy supply and services company, and president of the California Utilities Commission, uh, Public Utilities Commission from 2002 to 2014. Uh, and he was appointed there by Governor Gray Davis, but then reappointed by Governor Schwarzenegger and Brown. Uh, he's been a member and former chairman of the UC Davis Energy Efficiency Center and is now, um, I say, apparently retired. Um, because his presence here uh, shows that he's still extremely active and, and he's uh, recently published a, a book here as well. Um, so I, I think we can see retirement doesn't mean uh, stopping working for, for Mr. Peavy. Um, anyway, please join me in welcoming Mr. Peavy to our seminar series. Okay, she has to hook me up. So I guess, can you all hear me? Everything fine? Because it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. I've been in this room many a time. In fact, my picture's there on the wall with uh, Dan Sperling and Ann Chen Smith and Andy Har Hartigan and uh, Ralph Cavana, who succeeded me as the uh, uh, chair of the Energy Efficiency Institute, or about to be Institute. We called it a center, but now it's an institute. So that's an an advance, I guess. So I, I have a, a long association uh, with this uh, institute. You know, I'll, I'll stumble around between institute and center for a few weeks, perhaps. But it goes back. Do, 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 do everybody in this room understand how it came about, its formation? And, you know, you know I, uh, if you want to tell the story, you're welcome to do it. Well, this is a, a very abbreviated story. Uh, but when I was president of the Public Utilities Commission, when I went on the commission, PG&E was in bankruptcy. Um, they had, they, this is a, an aftermath of, or a part of the, the energy crisis. Of some, I'll talk about a little bit about it uh, uh, later. But PG&E was in bankruptcy, and the, uh, there was an effort to get them out of bankruptcy. And the federal bankruptcy judge uh, asked me and their CEO, guy at that time, a named Bob Glenn, to meet with him. And that began a process of, of a negotiated settlement uh, between the Public Utilities Commission on behalf of the state of California and PG&E uh, that it was eventually approved, ratified and approved by the Public Utilities Commission. Um, the couple of the, of the ingredients of that that I was uh, insistent on was, number one, that uh, all these lands that PG&E has in the Sierras and, and elsewhere in the state, but mostly in the Sierras, around the dams and all that they have, uh, be given uh, in public trust and perpetuity to the people of California. Uh, because PG&E had wanted to get out from under California regulation and under the Federal, FERC, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission regulation, they thought they would make more money. I, we won't go into all that stuff, but the the and so we thought it would be better, and they they ultimately agreed. The second thing that we negotiated, I tried to negotiate on behalf of of the uh, people of California, was that they would take shareholder money and fund something called the California Clean Energy Fund, and the purpose of the Clean Energy Fund was to invest in startup companies. Uh, you know, boot, at the very beginning of uh, uh, soon after their creation. Uh, and to get over uh, what uh, Art Rosenfeld, who's on these pictures around here too, uh, over there, uh, called the, uh, the Valley of Death, whereas uh, you, you start up a company, you have technology that you develop, but you can't get it to the point of getting investors and all into it. So we created something called the California uh, uh, Clean Energy Fund, and they put in $30 million, which, I mean, eventually $50 million of shareholder money, not customer money to uh, invest uh, in new technologies in companies that were within the PG&E service territory, which is basically Northern California, not exclusively, but largely not in Northern California. And so we, and we did. And one of our first investments and the most successful one was in Tesla. 
So you know, if, if you've watched the history of Tesla, you know how that is how that is going. This is before Elon Musk was part of Tesla. I might add, he, Musk was not the original creator of Tesla. He had anything to do with its creation or, or anything else. It first came out with a little uh, a two-seater sports car, and they were down in San Carlos, California, near Palo Alto. Uh, one of the uh, uh, board members of the company Clean Energy Fund was a fellow over there next to me in one of his pictures named Ralph Cavana, who's now the, the, the chair of the Energy Efficiency Institute Board of Advisors here. And Ralph one day said, you know, we ought to come up with a challenge grant to create an energy efficiency center in a university in uh, Northern California in the PG&E Service Territory, uh, which was a, you know, a very interesting idea. And so we did. We said, we We'll put up the first million dollars to any, any university in the PG&E service territory that would create an energy efficiency center because there, nothing had, there had been at the, up to that point in this country, not just in our state, in this country, no energy efficiency center. Uh, now there's work, in, individual work, and there's this campus that preceded that and all, but there wasn't something that kind of put it all together. And so the, there was a, a, a competition. Uh, between finalists were UC Davis, UC Berkeley, and Stanford. And lo and behold, UC Davis won the award. Uh, even though I'm a product of UC Berkeley, and Art Rosenfeld was a professor at UC Berkeley, the two of us and majority of our colleagues voted for UC Davis. And uh, so that's how this center came to be. Uh, I think it's fair to say, man, right? And uh, the, it, was, it, was, it was interesting, you know, because we tried to put what we thought was the public interest ahead of our more parochial interests. And I, as a product of Berkeley, I mean, I and still am, and I have, I have a, as a chair in economics at Berkeley, and my name and all, I have deep, deep regard and love for Berkeley. But you did a better job. And Dan Sperling and, and Andy uh, and, and others did a better job of presentation, and we thought that UC Davis could go farther, faster, and be more energetic than the others, and we have not been disappointed. So that's a little bit of, of background on the energy efficiency uh, center here and my connection early on. I was asked to talk about my personal background, and uh, it's already been mentioned of it, but I was born in New York and grew up in San Francisco. My, uh, parents came to California. I'm, I'm, I'm not a young guy. My parents came to California and, and at the end of World War II, uh, and uh, we, I grew up in San Francisco. I went to high school there, Lowell High School. If any of you from San Francisco know that it's kind of the academic school. Uh, I was not a very good student, but I did graduate. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, ended up ended up going to uh, USF, the University of San Francisco, a Jesuit school, and then transferring to, to Berkeley, and uh, staying in Berkeley uh, uh, to get a, a master's degree uh, in economics. Um, from there, I went to work for the federal government as an economist in Washington D.C. for four years, which was a, a truly a great job, but. At Cal, I had majored in, in economics with an emphasis on labor economics, and labor economics was a very popular field at the time. And in part, it was because I grew up in what, what one would call uh, today a left-wing labor household. Uh, my father was a union organizer uh, for uh, various unions uh, most of his life, uh, which is not a way to get wealthy. Uh, and uh, my mother was a devotee of his, and, and my parents eventually got divorced, and my, my mother remarried another labor <laughs> organizer type. Uh, it was the last name of Peavy. I was not born Michael Peavy. I, I, and uh, that was my stepfather's name. And uh, he, was a, he was a member of, the, if you go back and look at the, the old movies on Netflix or so, you ever look for the movie Reds? Uh, that was about the IWW, the Industrial Workers of the World, and uh, he was a member of the IWW. So I come from a, a somewhat politically uh, left-wing uh, background, and I went to work as an economist uh, uh, after getting out of uh, Berkeley uh, for the Department of Labor in Washington, D.C., and then was hired from there to, to be the research director 
for the California Labor Federation, AFL-CIO, which is the kind of the parent body for the, the, AF, the unions in, in California. And I, I was in, in that job uh, uh, with, uh, for seven years, with a, uh, uh, although I went to UC Berkeley for two years, uh, uh, worked at UC Berkeley for two years uh, as a coordinator of community programs for the chancellor. Uh, right after the People's Park episodes at Berkeley and the feeling that the university had to be more relevant to the community around it instead of just an ivy tower. Uh, a problem that still afflicts, I think, some of our universities today where the, you know, it's publish or perish kind of thing and all. It's very tough to get. My job was to try to get young professors, assistant professors, to uh, be more interested in the community and less interested in getting their latest uh, 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 research into some, you know, obscure magazine that no one else but, but themselves and a hundred other people will read. Uh, and that, I did that for a while. And then, then I uh, created with uh, Pat Brown, the father of the current governor, uh, uh, Jerry Brown, something called the California Council of Environmental and Economic Balance, which is an organization of unions and businesses and all uh, to uh, lobby in Sacramento and to take public positions on on policy issues of, uh, uh, that affected them in the environmental area, kind of a moderate uh, uh, environmental group, not the Chamber of Commerce and, and all. Uh, and from there I was hired uh, by the Sun California Edison Company, and in a few years I ended up being its president. The Edison Company is a very big utility company. It's like PG&E, but it's in Southern California. It doesn't have gas. It just provides electricity. Um, and I, I, I enjoyed that, kind of, that, that work immensely, but I was the number two person. I wasn't the number one person in the company. And so I eventually uh, moved on from there and created a company called New Energy. New Energy Ventures was its first name, which uh, when California deregulated uh, the electricity markets in this state, in the, uh, uh, I was, uh, we, we profited from that by becoming a supplier and a competitor of PG&E and Edison and all this. It was, it was an exciting time, and uh, we built the company way up from uh, three employees to 300 employees, and from no revenues to $700 million in revenues, and we ended up selling it for $100 million, of, uh, $92 million uh, uh, to an, uh, another company. And I didn't do much for a few months, and then the energy crisis hit, and Governor Davis asked me if I would help uh, him in uh, Sacramento, and I came up here for a few months as a volunteer, and, then I, and he ended up asking me if I would go on the Public Utilities Commission, which I did in 2002 and stayed there until uh, the conclusion of my second term in, uh, uh, in 2014. I was appointed by him, reappointed by Schwarzenegger, and kept in as president uh, by uh, Jerry Brown. So that's kind of uh, my background, I, ha I have uh, uh, three kids. My wife is uh, just retired from the California State Senate. She was a, Carol Liu is her name, uh, LIU. Uh, she, we live in Southern California, uh, uh, in La Cunada, which is between Glendale and Pasadena, if you know the area. And she was the state senator, they're Democrat, for uh, uh, two terms. And prior to that, she'd been in the State Assembly. So we have been involved in California politics and uh, issues, uh, policy issues in the energy, air quality, environmental area uh, for quite a, uh, quite a few years. Today I'd like to, and I also have just written a book, which is right here, California Goes Green is the name of the book, A Roadmap to Climate Leadership. It's about the history of California over the past 30 to 40 years and how we got to where we are today, which is much of what I do. I have a, talk about in the next uh, half hour or so will be uh, is referenced in, in this uh, book, which was uh, uh, written with a grant from the Energy Foundation uh, in part for the research and all that. And it, it's just come out. It's been out a, a few weeks now. And uh, it's available on Amazon. Uh, and or ben, ben will buy copies for you if you want. So, <laughs> any rate, um, I, 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 I've always had a, I guess you'd say, a strong environmental ethic. I've, I've cared about uh, California. I, I, I'm proud to live here. I think it's the most, one of the, probably the most marvelous place in the world, if not certainly one of them. Uh, and it's a very, very attractive, uh, been a very, very attractive home to myself, to my wife, and my kids, and, and all. Um, 
And I do think that we have an ethic here that differentiates us from a lot of other places uh, in this country. And I, I want to describe some ways that that came about and uh, with some contrast and compare. And I, I'm old enough to remember some of this. I mean, in uh, 1962, uh, California passed New York as the biggest state in the, in the nation in terms of population. Now it's far above everybody else. And there was uh, Pat Brown, the, fa the governor's father, was in uh, 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 governor. And this is a, a cause for rejoicing. This was fantastic. We, you know, we triumphed. We were the biggest, we were the best. Blah 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 blah. And that was the common view. Uh, we overwhelmingly, uh, sentimental uh, sentiments were in in that. Way it was California, you know. But what's happened since then? Why is California now taking a t track that is somewhat different than that? Uh, and uh, unlike Texas or Florida, I would say California is on a, 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 has been on a different path for some years. And uh, I think it's a good path. We could certainly discuss that at length if you if you wish. But it, but it, it is a different trail we've gone down. Uh, for quite a, quite a while now, then what was the case after World War II when everything was go, 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 grow, grow, grow? Those were, that was pretty much the, uh, the slogans. And a lot had happened in this state. I mean, we had, prior to World War II and through World War II, the financial center and heart of California was San Francisco, principally in the Bay Area. It was the financial community and everything else. After World War II, this moved. It moved significantly to Southern California. Southern California became the more dominant part of the state. You know, there's 10 million people who live in Los Angeles County alone. Uh, that's more people who live in the entire Bay Area, all the nine counties, and Sacramento, and, and Yolo, and everything else, counties combined. It's just in L.A. County. Then you have Orange, and San Diego, and San Bernardino, and Ventura, and, and Riverside, and so forth. Uh, and this significant shift happened in the econo economic uh, 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 determinism and, and, and development in Southern California. And things were great in, in many respects. But with it came a lot of attendant problems and challenges. One was smog, and the, and the second was sprawl. And people came to dislike sprawl, but they came to hate smog. And the unique thing about smog was that it affected everybody. It, just, it wasn't something you could just push off into South Central Los Angeles, to the black community or to the Hispanic community. It was everybody. If you lived in Pasadena and were wealthy, you still breathed the same air when you went outside as the person in, in, in South Central Los Angeles. So smog became a significant political problem. Believe it or not, the first time it was written about was in 1943 in World War II when the Los Angeles Times wrote a story saying that, that this terrible cloud had come over Los Angeles, uh, which turned out to be smog, and people thought it was an attack, a Japanese chemical attack during the war from a submarine. That's how, that's, believe it or not, you can go back and dig out, it's in the book, the reference, but be, you, you can dig out the news story. It, it, it's just amazing. So you had, you had smog and you had sprawl. And it, 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 it was intense in Southern California, more so than here in Northern California, although... Northern California had uh, had it too, and there was a growth of environmental concerns around them, sprawl and the smog, and so forth. Air quality was was the first biggest concern, and remains in many cases the, the biggest concern. And it led to the creation of, of first pollution controls on smog in the United States it was in Southern California, and it, and the, the the local government set up a, a uh, the county government in Los Angeles set up a, a, a monitoring and, and enforcement body, which became CARB, the California Air Resources Board. Today, it's called California Air Resources Board here in Sacramento, in Sacramento with most of its uh, facilities in Southern California, technical people, staff, engineers, scientists, and so forth. And its first head was a guy who was from the Netherlands, named Ari Hagen Schmidt. He was a Ph.D. at Caltech. California Institute of Technology in Pasadena. He, disco he, was, he discovered smog, uh, the, the cause of smog, which people didn't like to believe was the automobile, because there were so darn many of them. And what are you going to do about it? Um, and created the California.
California Air Resources Board by state statute to deal with this on a, on a statewide basis. And Ronald Reagan became governor and appointed Schmidt to be the first head of CARB, first head of CARB. Three years later, he fired him because he thought he was too aggressive in, uh, on the oil and particularly the automobile industries, which is kind of interesting. And then Schmidt died four years after that from lung cancer. So yeah, I mean, talk about irony of ironies. I mean, it's you know, really a, a, a very interesting story. But in 1970, Nixon was president of the United States and, we, and created the, the supported and created the, 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 the National Clean Air Act. And because California had been the pioneer. It was, it was in that federal statute called the, uh, the, the, the California exception, that California could have its own more severe regulations on air than the federal standards. And that has been in existence now since 1970, and uh, almost always has been granted, but not always, as I'll mention a, a little later. It did at one time uh, when Schwarzenegger was governor, the, the uh, Federal EPA would not grant that to the state of California, and Schwarzenegger made a big stink about it. And eventually, when Obama became president, uh, the ex exception was was granted, so California continued on the path that, that it had been on. But it, I'm talking about the causes of environmental smog, sprawl, growing concerns about land use questions, uh, the feeling that just we're eating up everything that that. The agricultural land is just going just to subdivision, subdivision, subdivision. And it was particularly intense feeling about the coastline of California. We have this unique and beautiful coast. And uh, in the uh, late 60s and early 70s, there was a, uh, a movement to build all kinds of things along the coast. If you're any of you from San Diego, you go to Coronado, right south of Coronado, uh, uh, south of the Del Coronado Hotel, if you go down there, you'll see a series of high-rise buildings along the, right on the water's edge. And people just hated that. But they, they got built. And then there was no public access to the beach anymore and so forth. Same thing happened uh, in, in Sonoma County, uh, a place called Sea Ranch, where I happen to have a home now. But <laughs> that's another story. The, 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 um, uh, the feeling that the coast was being walled off for people. And then PG&E wanted to build power plants all along the coast. They weren't the only ones, but they wanted to build, you know, anybody, you could, so it's only a two-hour drive, two-and-a-half-hour drive, and we go over to Bodega Bay, Bodega Head, PG&E. There's a great big hole there out of that point. PG&E was going to build a, a nuclear plant there. It finally got stopped by citizen uh, uh, causation. Uh, stopped that. But they, they wanted to build it there. They ended up going to Diablo Canyon, which is a, in a, a, a San Luis Obispo County. Uh, and all these things kind of came to create a, a, a fever for more environmental control by citizens. And in 1972, for the first time in, in the state's history, there was a citizen's initiative to create the Coastal Commission. It was done by initiative. It was not done by statute in Sacramento. It was done by the initiative process, and it was... And it, uh, the sponsors of it, environmental groups and others, and they were much weaker then than they are today, uh, were, were successful over the combined opposition, not only of the oil industry and of the utilities, but also government. All the local government didn't want any of this. Oh my God, you're going to tamper and have a statewide entity regulating development on the coast? That's our job. Well, it passed. Uh, it became the uh, the law of the state of California, uh, which is today continues as the California Coast, uh, under the California Coastal Act, and and I think everybody in this room should probably prize the California coast and its its essential preservation as an uh, open uh, for the public to enjoy all of it, uh, almost all of it. There's a there's little recurrent battles now and then about some property in San Mateo County or something, but by and large, it's it's been preserved. Um, I'm trying to just give you a sense of environmental, the environment, there was smog, there was sprawl, and then we had in 1969 the uh, Santa Barbara oil spill, uh, which was uh, uh, the biggest oil spill in the history of the country at that time until Exxon Valdez in Alaska and, in the, and the one in the Gulf of Mexico a few years back. And this was the Union Oil Company and it was off Santa, uh, um, 
Santa Barbara, and the oil spread on the beaches from Santa Barbara to the Mexican, all the south of, of, of the, the California-Mexico border. It was that it was devastating, and it, and that enraged people, frankly. And uh, thousands of birds were killed. The CEO of the company said, "I don't understand why people are so upset. No people were killed, just birds." Well, that was not totally in sync with the sentiments of, <laughs> of, a lot, of an awful lot of people. Um, all these things uh, were, were culminating there uh, and uh, gurgitating here in the state of California and, and gave rise to a greater concern by the environment and lasting concern by, by citizens. And then we had Jerry Brown. Jerry Brown got elected the first time. Now we're in Brown 2 now. Round one, he was 36 years old when he became governor. And he uh, ushered in a, a, a new time. And, and he was a uh, disciple to some degree at that time. He had Schumacher and Small is Beautiful and, and, and uh, a different perspective on things uh, than had, that his father had had or Reagan had had. And Reagan had, and, and Pat Brown had, had mixed records environmentally from my perspective. But there, there were... Uh, growing consciousness. Well, Jerry was much more in tune. And at the same time, the legislature did create the California Energy Commission. The California Energy Commission, uh, which exists today and is a funder of, of this uh, institute and, and all today, uh, it has uh, hundreds of employees and a research budget of $170 million and, and so forth, was a very a significant development in terms of energy policy and the work of, of, of this institute and, and of all the institutes uh, here and elsewhere in the state. And it did, it did so, three very significant things. First place, it took over the siting of power plants, gave it the responsibility to site power plants rather than the utilities themselves. That's, that, was, that was number one. Uh, secondly, it took over the role of forecasting. But if you, so you have, if you're going to site a power plant, you've got to have a basis for doing it. You have a basis for you doing it, you have to have a forecast of what future demand is. Who's going to do the demand studies? Well, in the past, it had always been the utilities. And they always seem to come out with very high numbers and build more plants. Well, if you know the economics of the utility business, you understand why. You make, it's a business where you make money on your capital investments. And uh, so there's incentive to do more uh, of that type. Not energy efficiency, but to build structure, physical structures that you get, you earn a return on. That's the economics of the utility business even today. Um, and the third major function, the one that in some ways is maybe perhaps the most lasting, is to be able to set uh, uh, regulations and requirements for appliances and all kinds of other things right down to the television that sits in the back of this room uh, for, their for their energy use. That's been uh, transformational. This state set the first uh, appliances for uh, uh, standards for refrigerators, led by that fellow on the wall, Art Rosenfeld, who convinced Jerry Brown that you could reduce, reduce and now we have, uh, a refrigerator uses 20% of the electricity it used 40 years ago. It was, you know, that's a huge, huge reduction. And there are many other things, uh, televisions and, and, and many other things. Building standards, R19, all, these, all the, these kind of things came out of the CEC. Uh, over its, its, its history of the last 40 years, 40 plus years now. Um, and it, it was dramatic. And I'd say of those three things, siting, uh, forecasting, and, and uh, regulation uh, and requirements and standards, that the latter one has, has turned out to be the, the most significant long-term one. They, they're all important, but uh, the, the latter has really made a huge difference. And spawned the interest in creating things like the Energy Efficiency Center here. And elsewhere in the country now, we have similar things. And at St Stanford has a major effort in this regard, and, and so forth. Those are the Brown days. I'm kind of going over this fairly quickly. But were, those are the Brown one days, eight years of that. He was followed as governor by, by two Republicans, George Duke Majin and Pete Wilson. Um, Duke Majin was... Uh, you know, steady as you go is kind of consolidate what's happened, don't do much uh, new. Uh, it was not, he was not anti-environment so much as he was uh, not particularly interested in, in going further steps uh, from 
what the CEC and, and others uh, had done, land use and so forth. But his ARB, or CARB, California Air Resources Board, its executive director, Jan Sharpless, did. And she was the first person, this is the Duke Major administration, Republican governor after Jerry Brown, to propose and uh, set, trying to set a standard to have zero emission vehicles. That began then. Didn't begin in the last few years under Schwarzenegger. It was all the way back uh, to Duke Majin. And that's another point. The, the, the interest in some of these things have gone on for a long time. Wilson followed that, Pete Wilson, uh, and uh, he, he, he wasn't particularly active uh, one way or another on, on a lot of these energy issues, other than he presided over the deregulation of the California electricity market. He's the one that signed it into law. Uh, the, the 1998 and uh, uh, created a very, a very consequential change. It was a deregulation at that time was sweeping the United States just like it had the UK, the United, United Kingdom a few years earlier under, under Margaret Thatcher and became very popular to want to uh, copy some of the things that were going on in the UK. You people are all in this room too young to remember, but we used to have something called the Civil Aeronautics Board. We used to regulate all the airlines, uh, where they flew, uh, the fares they could charge and everything else. We had that extensive regulation of the railroads, which is now largely gone. The Public Utilities Commission of the state of California used to regulate the in-state airlines, AirCal and PSA, that don't exist anymore. Uh, we used to regulate dump trucks, believe it or not. I mean, some of these things, you know, just as well that we're out of doing. but. Uh, there was a great movement toward deregulation, belief in the free market, uh, let competition thrive, and so forth, that led uh, to uh, deregulation of electricity markets in California, uh, which copied the UK experience, uh, very frankly. Uh, but it didn't work. The bottom line is it didn't work. Uh, uh, and it turned out to be a disaster. Not only companies like Enron, which went bankrupt ultimately, but, but others all participate in, in it. Uh, my wife went to the California Assembly. She was elected in 2000. And between the time that she was elected and six months later, the general fund surplus, it was a surplus, the general fund, Sacramento, went from $8 billion to zero. Now, what happened? The utilities couldn't... The prices that they had to pay for electricity from uh, the Enrons and others in the world went up, 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 up. The PUC did not uh, allow them to increase their rates, so they came near bankruptcy. As I said earlier, pg and &E ultimately went into bankruptcy. The state had to step into the business, the state of California, and spend its money buying power for all of us. Really quite a calamitous situation. Uh, and. It ended up the State Department of Water Resources credit had to be used uh, th uh, through a process called sleeving, S-L-E-E-V-I-N-G, uh, which just means that they bought the power and turned it over to Edison or PG&E or, or, or whoever else with the other providers. It was, a, uh, it was an absolute uh, catastrophe for the state of California. And it led to the recall of Gray Davis as governor the one that appointed me, led, led to his recall and replacement by Arnold Schwarzenegger. That's how Schwarzenegger became governor. He, he won uh, the election and was successful recalling Davis. Now, why was Davis recalled? Well, there's a lot of reasons. He, his office blames um, uh, the Public Utilities Commission. I, well, I was not a member at the time. Uh, and, and others, uh, uh, market manipulation and all that. But what happened, uh, uh, amongst other things, is that... The, the state wouldn't raise rates, and then all of a sudden it had to do a huge number, 30% in one fell swoop, uh, and electricity rates for, for everybody. But because the feeling, strong feeling in the legislature, they had to protect poor people, there was no rate increase for poor people. The first, the, and we came up with a tiered system. Prior to that time, there wasn't, we didn't have tiers. You just paid, you used electricity, you paid X. Uh, it was a slight tier, but there was nothing to it. it was, all of a sudden, we went to five tiers, very, very steep, going up. So your first 300 uh, kilowatt hours a month would be, let's say, eight cents. But then the next amount, 200 or 300, would be 12 cents, and so forth. It can, can go up steadily. You, you, you see 
I'm getting at. And this was to protect, to get the revenues to the utilities, but to protect low-income people. And this was the sponsorship of a legendary uh, uh, leader of the state senate at the time, John Burton from San Francisco. You may have heard his name. But, uh, and it was, it was, the motive was good. But the consequence was that because, because there was no, you had to increase the rates by 30%, but there was no increase for the lowest tier. Everything, all the other rates had to go up a lot more than 30% to get to the average of 30%. You follow me? It's not complicated. So like for PG&E, the, the, the overall rates for the higher users went up 80%. 80, not 30 and Edison went up 70. They, they all do differ a little bit for various reasons. They're not important here. Those people thought Davis was a tremendous failure. I mean, they were seeing it, their bottom line in their own pocketbooks, the consequences of him being governor. So when there was a recall effort, they voted him out, put in Schwarzenegger. Okay. That's, that's how, in significant part, it contributed uh, to that. feeling when Schwarzenegger came in was, God, this is a hell of a mess. We're on the way to recovery now, uh, and, but we got, we got to think anew what to do. And some of us, including myself and others, got involved in thinking really hard about energy efficiency and came to the conclusion that the state's priority Number one priority in electrical, electrical area was not to build more power plants and do more of this and more of that, but to, to do energy conservation or energy efficiency. And that's the road we headed down, energy efficiency. We made it, the state adopted a policy called the loading order and the energy action plan that energy efficiency was the number one priority, not building new power plants and so forth. That came out of that energy crisis, prior events, but principally out of that, that energy crisis. And I can remember in the years that I was involved with the center, going from the creation of the center to, to where we are today, that a big company like Chevron, whose CEO worked to this school and who has funded a, a chair here, significantly, Chevron has, the oak from saying, oh my God, what do you mean, e energy efficiency? That's not, that, that's overlooking the needs of people, and we, uh, we keep getting wealthier, and we need more growth, and, and more plants, and more this, and more that, to coming around to saying in their own advertising that the first thing you should do is energy efficiency, uh, and all. I mean, it's an interesting transformation, and uh, that was really reflective of the people of California. Uh, as, as well as uh, academic leaders and everything else. And, and of, of Schwarzenegger. The first time I met Schwarzenegger, really kind of funny, he invited myself and uh, one of my colleagues on the Public Utilities Commission, a woman named Susan Kennedy, uh, up to his office a, a few weeks after he was elected. Because uh, he, he wanted to meet us and, you know, we, he was stuck with us, if, whether he liked us or not, for a few years, because we all had term appointments, so, he, he, and he had, he had his interests. And the first thing uh, he told us about was his commitment to solar energy. He told us about how he, at age 18, had come to Venice, uh, California, Southern California, from Austria, and it was a beautiful place, but he couldn't believe the air quality so bad. And he was a bodybuilder, as you know, and went on to be Mr. Universe and you know, claim uh, uh, bodybuilder and, and all that for many years. Uh, just I, I couldn't stand the air quality. At that time, I became convinced that we had to do something about air quality. And he was, and uh, part of his answer was solar, solar energy. And he told he told us a story about Jim Cameron, who was the, the director producer of uh, Avatar, but also the uh, Titanic and uh, the Terminator movies. Uh, really made Schwarzenegger the star that he became. And he said, now, Peavy, he said, you're the head of the Public Utilities Commission. My friend Jim Cameron wants to put solar on his house in Los Angeles, and the utility won't let him do this. Now, you're the head of this. You've you got to fix this. 
I said, well, we'll do what we can. I went back to the office, found out that the reason we couldn't do anything about it wasn't, it wasn't the Edison Company that was serving them. It was uh, the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, a municipal utility that had no interest in putting solar, <laughs> having anything to do with solar energy for him, or for, at that time for anybody else, for that matter. So it wasn't on us, the onus of anything. But he came, he talked about a, his, his dream of a million solar roofs. He was going to create a million, uh, one created his first term as governor, a million solar roofs, uh, collectors on, on rooftops around. Uh, and his, uh, he couldn't get it, uh, legislation through the legislature. He asked the Public Utilities Commission uh, if we could do this. We, uh, we started it down that road, and the, the California, which became the California Solar Initiative, which is, it became, it's, it's passed. I mean, it's, it's achieved its goals. It's been uh, tremendously successful. We came up with an um, economic means of financing it uh, that uh, gave incentives that declined, declining block incentives rather than the feed-in tariffs that Germany and Italy and Spain and others have, have tried. And ours were, made the industry more competitive. Uh, the Chinese were a huge help in that regard, I might add. But sort of, that was his big interest, solar energy. Low carbon fuel standard, I won't get into that right now, was another great issue of his to reduce uh, the polluting content of, of fuel oils and gasoline. And AB 32, the, the California Global Warming Solutions Act, which he, in, 19, in 2006, as governor, signed into law, uh, sponsored by a woman whose picture is around here on the wall out there, Fran, then a member of the assembly, Fran Pavley. And his tremendous commitment uh, to uh, renewable energy, Schwarzenegger. He wanted to, to see us go from 20% renewables to 33% renewables to 50% renewables to even higher. That was his commitment. But I have to say he wasn't the first. In a, in a unique thing, the first real articulator of going to renewables for a third of the electricity generation in California was the head of the Edison, Southern California Edison Company before my time there, basically, a guy named Bill Gould said that, it, that it's incumbent upon us to see the changing world and that and he was way ahead of his time and he was looked upon somewhat derisively by some of his colleagues, way ahead of his time, that it's time to change and to go to a more renewable base and get away from the coal, get away from oil, and even get away from nuclear. But coal and oil were the, the polluting ones. Nuclear is not polluting in the day-to-day -day operations. And he, we, uh, Edison had these fights with Robert Redford over uh, proposed power plants, one called Kaparowitz in Utah, uh, that uh, Edison disbanded or decided not to build, and another one in Nevada, and, just, and to go down the renewable path. And it was the first one to sponsor significant renewable energy solar projects in the Mojave Desert uh, in, in the uh, late 70s and early 80s. The Edison Company and it shows you how you can have various kinds of leadership in corporate life. It's not always just uh, uh, avaricious, let's put it that way. Um, anyway, back to Schwarzenegger. I'll wrap up here in a few minutes. But, uh, he led the effort, uh, AB 32, California Global Warming Solutions Act, which has produced everything in the climate area pretty much that we've had in the last few years of requirements, uh, was uh, passed in 2006. In 2010, it was an effort to repeal it, an effort led by two oil companies, Tesoro and Bolero. And they spent millions of dollars trying to get that defeated. Uh, it was not defeated. Schwarzenegger was able to, to uh, and Brown, uh, were able to get people like George Schultz, a Republican former uh, Secretary of, uh, of State for Ronald Reagan, uh, and is nine, today 95 years old and is, a, is at the Hoover Institution at Stanford, to be the public face of Republican against this, uh, along with Tom Steyer, who you've all heard of, who's a billionaire Democrat who funds uh, these campaigns. Those two led the, the public fight in many ways uh, against the effort to, to repeal uh, AB 32. And uh, the voters of California voted 62 percent to 38 against changing that. That was a, a very significant vote. And at a time, 19, uh, 2010, when the economy nationally and in this state was not in good shape. And all the appeal of Valero and Tesoro was, this is hurting jobs and we want to create more jobs. Uh, they were, they were, it was defeated. 
Later that year, Jerry Brown became Brown too. He got elected governor the second time against Meg Whitman, uh, a woman who from uh, was now head of Hewlett Packard, who spent over $100 million of her own money in the campaign. I mean, just you just stop and think about that. It's rather amazing. Uh, uh, but she also opposed uh, this, this oil company effort. Uh, maybe not willingly at the start, but she did. She ended up doing it. Um, we got, then we got Brown as governor. And uh, Brown uh, has been carrying on the policies of Schwarzenegger right along and, and in many ways double down on some of those. Uh, the uh, uh, had continuity. Uh, he came in, he kept me on, he kept Mary Nichols on as head of the CARB, kept Bob Weissenmiller on as head of the California Energy Commission, uh, and uh, Bob Foster is the, the, the chair of the I California Independent System Operator as it re regulates the, uh, the uh, transmission assets in the state. On uh, uh, from the Schwarzenegger administration, there was tremendous uh, continuity, and that's uh, kind of it's continued to this day. This this year, and the bipartisanship to some degree has continued to stay. But uh, here we have now Brown in his seventh year of his second term, the second time he's been governor, and he's become a uh, international spokesperson for this country on climate. Uh, and on uh, renewables, but particularly climate, and all in part, you know, aided by the fact that we have someone who seems to be looking back 100 plus years uh, in Washington, D.C. Um, I'd like to, to conclude by saying, what are, what are the things that, that is really, I've reflected a lot about this. What has set California apart from these other states? I mentioned that at the start. And there, there are several items uh, that, are, that I, I just want to mention that we're happy to, to discuss. One of them is there has been a bipartisanship in many ways. Uh, not just Schwarzenegger and Brown or Schultz and Steyer, but going back. I said even uh, George Duke Majin, his head of the a ARB, wanted to have zero emission vehicles and all. And there's always been a, 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 a group of Republicans that, unlike in other states, that have voted with the majority of Democrats in many areas. Just Brown was able just a few months ago to get the cap and trade legislation that is so essential uh, to funding some things uh, like the bullet train and all that, uh, but many other things too. Uh, uh, through the, the legislature with a two-thirds vote, he got a significant number of Republicans in the assembly to vote for that, which was not expected by many people to happen, but it shows a continuing effort by, uh, in, in that regard. Uh, so bipartisanship, uh, the willingness to cross over and work uh, with uh, both parties on some of these issues has been a, a, a hallmark of California leadership that doesn't exist in most other states. Secondly, the quality, I think, of the leadership and the professionalism uh, that, that, are, that are attended here. At the staff levels, um, the scientists and engineers at, at CARB are some of the best you could find. Um, Mary Nichols is, an, uh, is the head of it. Uh, she's an example. But Mary Nichols was the head of the ARB, the California Air Resources Board, the second term, the first time Brown was governor. And then, uh, then she, did, she was at UCLA and, and various other things. And she was at the, under Clinton in the federal EPA. Then she came back into government. Schwarzenegger brought her back into government uh, as, as the head of the ARB, and, and Brown is Sure, there's a continuity there that, that and, and the people feel comfortable with. Uh, even when they get regulated, they feel comfortable with. At least they, they know it's not going to be, things aren't going to change uh, uh, quickly. There, there's a constant course that the state has set itself on. I mean, she's one example. Bob Weissenmiller at the Energy Commission is another one. Started out as a staffer. He's been now the chair of the commission for several years. I was an example of this of continuity of people working together. Uh, and... But it's not just the, the executives that are the political appointees. Uh, it's also the uh, uh, competency that, that exists at the staff. Great opportunities. Uh, the CARB staff is the one that discovered Volkswagen's cheating. You know, it cost Volkswagen $15 billion plus now. It, was, it, it wasn't the federal government. It was the staff here, right here uh, uh, in California, the CARB staff. Um, the dollars that, that the Energy Commission um, provides, uh, uh, some of which comes here, uh, the 170 plus million dollars a year research 
monies. Uh, that, which comes from the Public Utilities Commission, putting a levy on, on people, uh, has, is an example of the continuing efforts to strengthen uh, uh, these, these joint efforts. Another, another example. But we have, we're blessed, we have wonderful universities. It's not just Davis, it's not just Berkeley, it's not just UCLA, it's Irvine, it's San Diego, and other UC campuses. It's Stanford, it's Caltech, which, as I said years ago, was Hagen Schmidt was there, but it's continued on. It, Caltech oversees the Jet Propulsion Lab uh, in Pasadena, so La Cunada. Uh, we have tremendous national labs, the Lawrence Berkeley Lab and, and the uh, Lawrence Livermore Lab. Lawrence Livermore Lab used to solely be in the weapons business. Uh, Lawrence Berkeley Lab was, had much of the same uh, efforts. Most of its efforts, much of its efforts now are in climate, climate change, and all. And these are great assets to the state of California. And the working relationships between the UC system and others and those labs is very important. But it's not just it's a, the California State University system, too. The biggest provider and graduate, of, graduate school for engineers in the state of California is San Jose State University. Turns out over 1,000 engineers a year, that many of whom go work in Silicon Valley and others, you know, whatever some of you may very well be that, that product. Um, so I mentioned national labs. I mentioned bipartisanship. I mentioned the university system. The, one of the other things that institutionally doesn't get any attention but, but is really important is the funding sources for these agencies that are so important, like the like CARB, the Energy Commission, the Public Utilities Commission. Are, they have their own energy funding sources. They are not dependent on the whims of the legislature day in and day out to yank you up and down. That gives stability. It gives stability to the staff, gives stability in a lot of ways in terms of program. Yes, the legislature has to adopt your budget, but the income stream is separate from the general fund income stream in the state of California. It's really a tithing on uh, uh, utility customers. And that provides a certain security that uh, is, I think, very important uh, for the maintenance of the organizations. Then we have, as I, I said, research competency and all. i give you the example of um, Volkswagen and all that. But there are, there are many, many others. Uh, we continue to push the envelope on air quality uh, with new regulations all the time. There will be t tremendous fights between the federal EPA and California, I think, over the next couple of years because of some of that. And the, the innovation that's coming out of here, just as an example, the Energy Efficiency uh, Institute Center where the, the lighting and, and water and heating uh, aspects of it. These are incredible things that are having real impacts uh, in industry and, and all that you can take great pride in. It's something that dis distinguishes California. The solar initiative was another one, and the way we, did, we went about funding it. The, uh, we came up with the Public Utilities Commission program, smart meters. Everybody in the state now has what's called smart meters. So uh, before that time, if you had an electric outage at your house, uh, the utility didn't know unless you called up and said, my power's out. Now they know instantly. Uh, those are innovations that have come, come about uh, that we've done. Net energy metering. You had The author of that was here for some time, and now she's back in the state senate, uh, Nancy Skinner. Uh, legislation that, that provided that if you put a solar on your roof, you could uh, uh, get some return on the excess power that if you generated from the utility company pay you back uh, for that power, uh, which was not something that was, that was eagerly uh, sought after or encouraged by the utilities, let me tell you. Uh, another is energy storage, a, a growing, a tremendous growing business. These are examples of innovation coming out of this complex in California, the national labs and, and, uh, and the university system and, and the regulatory bodies that, are, that do set California apart, very frankly. And energy storage is the next great opportunities here. We're going to be able to store solar energy, batteries at a good price. The question is the price. And uh, Elon Musk has made that commitment. We'll see how successful we are. All those batteries are being built there outside of Reno now, Sparks and all that. All these things, you put it all together, if there's one thing you could remember, and have you remember, to give a measure of how well, we have, we've done, relatively speaking, relatively speaking, 
so much more to do. But is that if you look, you see this repeated all the time. Californians love to talk about it, that we have the sixth biggest economy in the world, right? You see this repeatedly. Sometimes it's seventh, sometimes France a little bit higher. But it's right. Number six in the, in the world, 40 million people, sixth biggest economy if we were a standalone nation. That's very nice. But if you look at greenhouse gas emissions, we rank 20th. We are doing th relatively three times better than most other places. China is the worst on a per capita view of gas emissions, and the United States is not very far behind. But California ranks 20th. We have done so much better job than most any other place. Uh, although we'll have, there's plenty of competition, I think. In the, in the group. Yeah. And that is, to me, as someone who's trained as an economist, something I like to look at those kind of numbers as a, as a prize for how well uh, we, can, we can do and have done and every reason hope to continue to do in the years ahead. You know, at the end of the day, and I'll just close on this note, at the end of the day, we could uh, say thank you to this group, thank you to that group, thank you to this leader, thank you to that leader. But I think it's, in the end, it really, and there's, there's a push and pull in this, but in the end it's the people of this state the people of the state, the majority of which seem to be in sync with the goals that we have set on climate change, on air quality, on environmental protections, whether it be the coastline or air quality, whether it be greenhouse gas reductions or repudiation of efforts to try to repeal that. Polls, poll after poll after poll, shows overwhelming environmental support for environmental initiatives in this state. And it shows that they're stronger among Democrats than Republicans, but a lot of Republicans feel the same way. It is, uh, it is not an exclusively a one-party thing. And I think it's very important that it stays not a one-party thing to the extent we can do it. There's a strong environmental ethic, and whether people live north or south or east or west, uh, I have a lot of faith in Californians, and I have a lot of faith in us going forward. With that, I'll open it up to questions from any of you you'd like. That's, that's a big, big field. I mean, can you be a little more precise? Yeah, I think uh, particularly in the environmental area, so we're taking a look at things like the technology and the quality of the things that are part of the system. Uh, what you're doing is you're talking about a system that has a lot of different parts to it. Um, so I guess when I think about this, I'm thinking about the context of your situation. Um, there were a lot of uh, Well, on community choice aggregation, I, I have very mixed feelings about it. And, and for uh, does everybody know what it is, what we're talking about here? Community choice aggregation. Well, during the energy crisis, the legislature passed a statute that said that communities, counties. Uh, can create their own um, utility to provide, to go out and buy electricity and provide it to, the citizens, to their citizens, or their, uh, their, their, uh, their voters and, and residents. Um, it was passed in 2001 or 2002, I can't remember. Nobody paid any attention to it for 10 years uh, until Marin County started to, to get into this business. Uh, and it got into this business, and the PG&E did its best to thwart it at the start. Frankly, we had to stop them at the PUC, say so you can't do that. But, but um, so what happens is Marin County and now Sonoma County and several others, going to be Los Angeles County, San Francisco, many, uh, go out and, and don't rely on the utility to procure uh, uh, the uh, electricity, the generation of it. They do it on their own. 
And their argument is they can get cleaner energy quicker and so forth in so doing. There's some truth to that. Uh, um, but I think the downside of that is that you're going to have this tremendous spread of all these entities eventually that, are, that um, whose interests may not be the same as the, as the overall state public interest. And I, and I have a bias I, because I was a regulator and it was easier to regulate a few utilities than to have to worry about all these parties uh, who will ultimately get their own lobbying efforts in Sacramento and may have financial interest to subsidize uh, the, uh, the entity that created them in a way that you don't, that you don't have with, so much with the, the IOU. So it complicates life. And I'm not sure... I mean, I, I, have, I, I feel very cautious about it. I mean, I supported it originally. Hell, I headed a company at one time did the same thing. So, I mean, I can't be uh, uh, too negative about, about some of this. But you do get this breakup of, of kind of a monolith. And the, the, the problem is that, that uh, amongst others, is that you don't necessarily get any wiser decision making. You get a lot more bureaucracy. And... What I worry about is, let's take the city of Los Angeles. The city of Los Angeles has the biggest municipal utility in America, the Department of Water and Power. And it provides $200 million a year to the general fund of the city of Los Angeles. In other words, the, it, the money goes from them to the general fund. So it's, I've always had a tough time squaring their commitment to energy efficiency, which could reduce their revenues, with the very revenues I'm talking about, when those the political bodies want that revenue stream. You follow me? I mean, I remember at that time, the, during the energy crisis, the, the mayor of Los Angeles at the time, his name was Richard Reardon, calling me and saying, you know, getting mad about the, the director of the department, of, uh, his, his own director, saying he's not working hard enough to get as much money as possible. I want more cops. You know? Well, that's, I mean, it's understandable. I want to have more police on the streets. But, you know, and this is a way to fund them, you know? And screw Edison. Let's get more money out of Edison. Now we got them on the ropes. They're hurting. You know, I mean, that, now that's an exact, you know, uh, exaggeration. But that was the attitude. And uh, so I'm not sure that, that all this is, is, is the best thing. I, I, I have to sort this out myself. I've been on both sides. I don't, have, I don't have a perfect answer for you, but I know that having many entities, uh, will, you, you, you're going to economically, you, you're not ensuring greater efficiency, number one. You're getting another layer of bureaucracy. And, and, and number two, you may have differing long-term interests as entities than you could have uh, legislature adopt something or go, the governor adopts something or the public utilities adopts a policy, and then that tends to be the policy of the state. And we've been very green. I'm just not sure how many, how, how much more these, some of these other entities will be green. You know, PG&E, with all the brickbats that are thrown at them, is a very green utility if you measure green by lack of carbon emission, of emissions. Because they, they've got 20% they got of electricity in a normal year, even more this year, from hydro. The dams have been built, for, been there around for a long time. And they get another 20% from the nuclear unit, which will be closed. And then they have, they're over 20%, uh, it'll be closed in 2023 or 2025. But there's, whatever else you want to say negatively about nuclear, it doesn't have emissions. And then you, they get another 20 plus percent from renewable energy, solar and wind and geothermal and all. And it's tough to, to, to have a Sonoma County or Marin County go out and duplicate that. It really is. So, yes, sir. Well, that's a challenge to, to uh, uh, I think, other places in the country. I mean, 
you could have good regulation and bad regulation. I think a, a, much of the regulation we've done in California has, has stimulated the economy, uh, not hurt it. And uh, the, the people will differ on that. And maybe in areas like housing, it's had a very uh, negative impact I mean, because housing costs are so high in California and so forth. But let's just take, let's just take uh, solar as a, uh, uh, and, and let me re reiterate what I said a little earlier. We came up with a scheme, economists did, for, uh, with Schwarzenegger for the uh, California Solar Initiative, where we provided a subsidy each year uh, per kilowatt hour that declined, as it's going to call it a declining block rate. Every year it went down. And the idea was to try to make the industry more efficient. When we started out in 2006, it was, it was a very high cost business. It's become much, much uh, cheaper. Uh, we decided to do that to incentivize them. And, and the, the head of Solar City told me, he said, you did more to stimulate the economies of this industry than anybody else by what you did at the PUC by creating incentives to become more efficient. And those are the kind of, government can do those kind of things. It can also do stupid things. So it's, you know, it's, 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 it's a trade. You never know, you never know for sure which one you're going to have at the beginning, perhaps. But it, it's worked out. There, there have been, there have been other things. There's no, there's no question that that the the carbs incentives on on uh, autom on electric vehicles and the subsidies that we we provide has stimulated electric vehicle market, where one half of the electric vehicles in the United States are driven in this state. Now, you may say, well, you know, is that a great thing or not? I mean, because uh, they, the cars cost more, gasoline costs more here too. There's, you know, because of the, well, we required the ingredients to be. But I, I think overall the, the, the consequences have shown that, that we've had a stimulating economy and a growing economy with uh, far better environmental protections than you could find most elsewhere in the United States. And we, don't, we didn't just do what Nevada has done. I, mean, I went through this at the PUC when we had, what are we going to do about Elon Musk's battery factory? He wants to build a, do we compete for it? Well, Nevada spent over a billion dollars in public funds to have that located near Reno. Now, was that, was that a wise investment by Nevada? I guess, we'll, we'll find out over time, I guess. They located it as close to California as they could, and yet as close as they could, so the trucks run from there down to, down to, to Tesla's factory in, uh, in Fremont every day. But we didn't bear, we didn't bear any of those costs. But we, we got a lot of economic benefits. So the management and all that is the people working there at Tesla live in Lake Tahoe, you know, and drive, drive to... So there, there are, there are trade-offs trade here. And um, as economists, it's kind of up to, to us to figure them out. And that's why I think it's so important to try to, to make sure that we have adequate, competent staff with longevity in these agencies which gets to other things like paying better, but that's, a, that's beyond my purview today, you know, uh, everywhere. Uh, and one of the reasons we wrote this book is some of those things I said that set California apart, that we want to see, I, I want to see other states adopt some of those things. They can't do all those things, but they can certainly put more emphasis in the university system, more emphasis on it research, they could do better on their budgets, they could do, some of them could do a lot more. And the Energy Foundation, which has gave us some money to do this book, uh, has expressed an interest in sending, you know, in sending this book to, to, uh, to other places to try to incur uh, change, change behavior. And, you know, I, I personally think that we're in, a, we're in a, a bit of a mess right now. We got a national government that seems to have turned its back on not only what California has done, but what New England or any place else seems to want to do, go back and harkens back to an era uh, uh, long, long ago almost, you know. And we, we have to show to the world that there are other paths besides the current EPA path or the current, I don't want to sound overly pejorative, but the current Trump path, because you wonder if there's any understanding at all about some of this stuff going on. I mean, very, very fundamentally, when you deny climate change after seeing so many consequences of, potentially of it, you know. <laughs> anyway. um, I have a question about uh, the Department of Energy. One of the things that we have is a lot of 
Right. Right. And the Navy had the Navy and Marine Corps have a number of bases mostly Southern California. Right. Can you speak to uh, the CPT's interaction with the Department of Navy and how that partnership has worked and what the Navy Well, I, I no, I, I mean I can't speak in intimate detail because I, I haven't been out of that for a couple of years. But I say the the former Assistant Secretary of the Navy. Uh, was Jackie Fanestil, who prior to that was was the chair of the California Energy Commission. That relationship was very good. And she did, she did a great job and in, in increased environmental awareness not only of the Navy, but uh, but of the the Marine Corps, Twenty Nine Palms, and, and elsewhere. There's no question about it. I think everything I know it's working very well. But I'm but I'm not up on the latest, so I, I can't help you in, in details of that. But I thought it was pioneering. And it was pioneering that the Navy reached out and, and asked her to be assistant secretary. Uh, that was, you know, a woman, assistant secretary of the U.S. Navy over the Marine Corps and the Navy. I mean, that's a, you know, there's an Obama administration. I mean, it probably never happened today, but, but you know, that, was, that, was, that itself was pretty dramatic. Secondly, she didn't have a, any history in, in the military. I mean, it's, uh, and third, the, the Navy adopted uh, wanted to, to move in this area and reduce its emissions very significantly. Now, that's happening in the Army, too, enough for military reasons. But the, but the Navy's wasn't so, as much direct military reasons as there were more general public reasons, I think. Is there a hand back there? Well, you know, there's 40 million people live here. There's 1.2 billion or 1.3 billion live in China. I think China is going to surpass this country and California pretty quickly in its commitment to solar energy and to electric vehicles. All we have to do is read the press to get a sense of that. And the, the interesting thing to me I don't have an answer for you that uh, we could, I, I'm not suggesting we duplicate the China regime, you know, which is totalitarian in many extents. But there is something, that there, but what it does show you, the incredible progress of China economically, put aside solar for a moment, over the last 20 years, I mean, it, it, this is a phenomenon the world has never seen, to bring, there's many people in the middle class in China today that has lived in the United States, about approximately 300 million people. They, they are surpassing us in, in, in numerous ways, and the economic model is not pure unfettered capitalism. It's a, it's a different economic model, and it seems to be succeeding for them. Uh, uh, now, whether it's, it's, it's sustainable, I mean, they have tremendous problems financially with the banks there and all that, but the sustainable, I, you know, is, is questionable, and the rate will come down to growth. It cannot continue at that rate, but contrast... They're, they're with India, and you know, you, I think you would choose the economic model of China, although I mean, not the political model. But the the um, how all this ultimately plays out, I don't know. But I what I want to see our state do is to be the leader with entities like here and as many as we can possibly can technical leadership because uh, in in all kinds of technologies. But I, you know, when they say you're going to we're going to go to X 25% electric vehicles by in, in, by in, in 2025 or a little less than that, and that anybody that sells cars there is going to have to have a certain component that high of electric vehicles. And we're doing the same thing on solar. And it's true, they are. And the reason, one of the reasons we benefited from, from uh, solar energy in California is because they've driven down the price so radically in China. Uh, but they're also having a huge market in China, much, much bigger than in the United States. I mean, these things are all uh, a dynamic that, that are, is, is worth a very careful study and, and may, in some places, ways of emulating, I think. I worry that we're going to be surpassed by, by them. The R&D and all that is, we still lead, but how much longer can that continue with all these other resources and, and all, and the experience that, that comes out of all that? So there may be... There are things that we could learn from China. I'm not sure exactly what they are. Uh, but my point, the fundamental point is there are more than one way to skin a cat. 
economically and socially. Yes, sir, or whatever. How deep should not consumer participation be considered? Not just people purchasing into it, creating economic incentives. What I mean is, first of all, we're looking at China and to some extent California. We have a lot of experts and technical experts in this regulation. In order to make this whole transition, we buy-in from people beyond just their economic interest. Tax credit here and there, and that sort of stuff. People that are lower class and you know, working class, to get them to get involved, it's going to be far more challenging. It's all hands on deck in order to strip over to electric uh, cars and all this other stuff. Um, now, you're not talking about the deplorables, I hope. <laughs> but, I mean, that's the thing. If we engage the general public in this, one of the challenges with that is the technical expertise in their understanding of a very sophisticated system. And I just see a really big bottleneck there that we're not talking about the citizen engagement. That's going to be a huge impediment to really do this. Yeah, but I, but I think California citizens are engaged. I think you have more engagement here than you probably do most anywhere in the United States. I mean, maybe not Vermont or something, but I mean, I'm a great big place. I think you get more awareness, more following, more media attention, uh, and people are much more sophisticated here. And, and I think we, we do have significant citizen involvement. Yes, I'd like to see a lot more. Of course, we all would on, on, on many fronts. Uh, not just negative stuff about we don't want this building here because it's cast a shadow on me or something or the windmill. But I mean, the, uh, uh, but I, I feel, I mean, compared to other, most other societies you could think of just about anywhere, there's more engagement here than, than there. Don't you agree? Well, look, look, yes. But let me throw a follow up. The California model is not going to be re replicable throughout the rest of the United States. No. All hands up. Yes. And so it's, that, that's kind of where I'm feeling. Like California, it's great. We can do this in California. Great. Going back to my home state of Illinois. Well, you have, and that's a very good point. And, you know, you think about Arkansas, how are you going to do something? But, yeah. but uh, that, that's true. But we can, I mean, it's, it's incumbent upon us in, in California to 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 project uh, and export our technologies and our knowledges. And there's different ways of doing it, including, uh, for example, in the West, a more regional grid, I think, makes, makes, personally, it makes a lot of sense, even though we would give up some of our own parochialism and our, you know, we're Californians, we've got to hold all these controls ourselves. But I think, it, and we're, we're trying to do that with British Columbia, Oregon, Washington, Quebec, Ontario, uh, uh, and uh, there's, there's East of Canada, and m more in the West, and it's it's a job of persuasion and and leadership. And I I'm going to miss uh, the current governor very much in this regard because I think he has uh, exemplified so much in a very positive way about reaching out to others. And uh, you know, and I think the last year or so, the election of Trump is just spurred him on on this, but it's more than him. I mean, it's 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 all of us and, and trying to work uh, uh, with others, particularly for people in government and in universities and all that, and to broaden our own horizons. I don't want to tell my book too much, but I mean, you'll find it interesting, but Ben promised me he'll buy a few copies. So. <laughs>